welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Happy summer. Today is uh, World Refugee Day, if you didn't know. It's also Juneteenth, but it is World Refugee Day, and we wanted to hop on. We're going to hop on with a couple of our friends. Uh, we Choose Welcome, and of course, our founding and supporting partner, World Relief. So we're going to be talking with Jenny Yang and then Sheila Joyner from We Choose Welcome. So they're going to join on here in just a second, but for those of you who don't know what World Refugee Day is, it's an international day. Hold on one second. I know they're trying to get on. Hold on. Um, it's an international day designated to honor refugees from around the globe. And I think We Choose Welcome is going to join here in just one second. There's Sheila. Hey. Hi. Hi, Hi Sheila. Hi. Okay, so now we're just going to wait for Jenny to pop on real quick from World Relief. And um, anyways, we're just telling a little bit about World Refugee Day. And um, again, there's Jenny, so I see her. Um, it's an international day designed to honor refugees from around the globe. And we know right now that there are over 89 million forcibly displaced people around the globe. And uh, refugees are uniquely vulnerable um, for having to leave, forcibly leave, usually by violence or persecution or uh, natural disasters, having to leave their home and their safety and their communities, the resources that they have at their disposal, their culture to find safety and find a new home. So we're gonna talk um, briefly today about what is the current landscape for refugees right now around the globe and in the US. And then we're also going to talk about a couple of really tangible things we can do to support refugees, um, moving into kind of things you might be able to do for the summer, things you can do with your kids, things to remember and advocate for. And then of course, what are some resources? We're gonna give you some really good resources to uh, jump into that. So we're gonna wait. Hi, everybody. We're just gonna wait one minute for Jenny. I know she, I saw her come on, but I don't know if she's switching over to World Relief or, or if she is just trying to find the invite button. The last time I think that Jenny and I did a live together, it was maybe a couple times ago, uh, her boys, I was like, literally, my kids had like yogurt and snacks outside the door. And like, I'm like, just watch TV, like anything but YouTube, like, you know, PBS would be great. <laughs> and then like, I could just hear them like tapping on the door. Hi, everybody. And then um, Jenny's kids just like came in full on, like knocked <laughs> over the camera and she's talking sideways. And it was just this wonderful, like working mom moment where you were like, yep this is where we are. We're still here, you know, yes. still affecting us all. <laughs> so it was really good. Uh, okay. So Jenny just signed on to World Relief. So she is going to be asking to come on here in just in a second. So Sheila, you've got kids at home too, right? Are they being occupied by something yes. as well? <laughs> yeah. The two of mine are older, so they, they can kind of take care of themselves. But my eight-year-old, my, my husband has him doing quiet time <laughs> in the well, bedroom. We conversation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The quiet time. Yes. Yes. Good quiet time. Oh, so if you have questions while we're having this conversation, um, please type them in the comments and then we'll all kind of be looking at those and trying to answer those as well. So as soon as Jenny hops on here, we are going to get a current landscape of what's going on globally. And what does 89 million forcibly displaced people, what does that really mean when we break it down? And then also what's the difference between kind of the last four years or so and what's going on currently and what we need to be advocating for. We're going to talk about things you can practically do and then uh, resources to help you go deeper. So when Jenny hits the invite button, well, she said that she requested to join. Let's see here. Let me look. Yes, she did it. And I just missed it because we were busy chatting about all the things. Here she is. Okay, we'll get started here. She's going to come right in. Okay. Uh she is. Hi, friend. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I requested a few times and then uh, I'm glad now. And you're like, Bree, just let me in. Like, yeah. let's, let's, why are you waiting? <laughs> okay, so just so everyone knows, um, this is Bree Stentry, Women of Welcome. This is Sheila Joyner from We Choose Welcome. And then we have Jenny Yang from World Relief. And so we are all kind of uh, sister organization friendships. Um, and we love supporting what each other is doing because we mm -hmm. each have a unique flavor and, and 
the language and the resources that we bring to the table, but World Relief is a supporting partner for all of us, which is just so wonderful. So Jenny, you've already kind of given a brief about uh, World Refugee Day, about what a refugee is. Yeah. And so I'm just going to pitch it over to you about, just give us the current landscape. I've talked about there are over 89 million forcibly displaced people. What does that exactly mean? And what does that mean just about the U.S. being welcoming in terms of this massive number? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's been startling because um, the 80, the over 80 million that are displaced was a number at the end of 2021. Um, but at the end of May, the UN actually released some new statistics where they found that over 100 million people have been forcibly displaced. Um, and so this is actually the highest number in recorded history. And so the UN started collecting data right at the end of World War II. And so what we're facing now in terms of people that are being forced to flee from their homes, um, that number is greater than any time since World War II. And so um, it's really been fueled um, over this past year by um, the conflict in Ukraine and, uh, and what's happened in Afghanistan as well. Um, and so these are the newer conflicts that are producing new refugees, but then you obviously have um, simmering conflicts that have been, you know, happening for 10 to 20 years where there's no quick resolution like the conflict in Syria and in Ethiopia, which still make up large numbers of refugees around the world as well. So um, I think it's important to note, though, that even though we're, we're celebrating uh, World Refugee Day, which is today, June 20th, but the majority of people that are forcibly displaced are actually not technically refugees which means that you have to cross an international border to seek protection overseas, but you're actually an internally displaced person, an IDP, which means that you don't cross an international border, but you're in another part of your home country seeking protection as well. And so the, the majority of those who are forcibly displaced are IDPs, um, and then a, a, a smaller number than IDPs are, are actually refugees. So um, if you look at the numbers from last year, it's around 53 million people are IDPs, and then around 27 million people are refugees. So um, maybe about 40% of that number as well. Um, I think it's also important to note, even for many of us who live in the United States, that there's a lot of um, conversations around how many should we accept in the U.S., and those are important conversations to have. But over 80% of the world's refugees um, are actually hosted in lower to middle income countries, which means that for the majority of those who are fleeing across the border and trying to find safety elsewhere, that they're not going to a resource rich country. They're going to a country in which they themselves have limited resources, but are doing everything oftentimes to help refugees that are fleeing into their country. Um, and so the United States has played a role. Um, obviously, I think we play a role in in uh, accepting those who are seeking asylum at our borders. But the U.S. also has a program called the U.S. Refugee Missions Program where we, this president actually sets a number every year. And that number is the number we aim to resettle uh, for that fiscal year. So the past few years have been really challenging because the program has really been dismantled. And so it took a lot of work to rebuild it. And so um, at the end of May, um, we're at around 12,000 arrivals, refugee arrivals to the United States. Um, and that's against the ceiling of 125,000, which the president set, which the administration is wanting to reach. We want to resettle 125,000, but because of just systematic issues, lengthy processes and other issues that have come up, it's been very challenging to, to meet that goal. Um, but I would and say- We're on track to like only place, take in about 20,000 if we keep on pace, correct? Yeah, that's correct. We're nowhere near that ceiling that we could take in. That's correct. But I think this year was a little bit of an anomaly because even though we've only resettled 12,000 refugees this year, we have yeah. uh, helped 70,000 Afghans who didn't come in as refugees. They came in as parolees, which is a temporary immigration status. And then right now we're in the process of resettling potentially up to 20, 30,000 or more Ukrainians. Um, and so if you add those numbers up, then, you know, technically we have probably resettled, you know, over a hundred thousand people that are forced to flee because of war, but they're just coming under different statuses. Right. Right. So when you look at the number, 
and you hear the reasoning, we talked a little bit of just some of the reasoning um, of why people are displaced, but then having to cross international borders. What would you say to someone who would say that number is just so massive? I, I don't even, how is that even possible to actually create solutions within? It's so complex and so massive that feels like way too many people. Yeah, well, I think it's it's important that behind every number, we recognize that there is an individual and an individual story. And I think, yeah, the numbers can seem very daunting. But when you get to meet a lot of these people individually, you meet them face to face, they live in your neighborhood, in your community, you realize that, you know, they each have su suffered really significant loss because they're not in their homes anymore. And so I think humanizing some of these stories and making sure that we are doing everything we can to um, understand why they fled and where they're going to um, is is really important. And so, like, I know when, for me, um, just hearing some of the stories of some of the Ukrainians that have been forcibly displaced and even some of the Afghans that have actually come in, um, you know, so many, they're so grateful to be here, even though there's a lot of challenges with starting a new life in the United States. Um, but I know like where I live in Baltimore, there's a large number of Afghans that have come here and many of them are eager to, you know, find a job and, and their kids are starting school. And so it's really a, tr a tremendous time. And so um, I think, you know, for us to indiv individualize the numbers is and humanize the numbers is, is incredibly important. And, you know, as much as we can do that through building relationships with people that are living in our neighborhoods, I think, you know, that's what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah. And Sheila, you know, we're going to go, Sheila's going to tell us some ways to just tangibly engage. And then I'm going to share some resources. Um, and we'll have Jenny just wrap up at the end here. So we won't be much longer here. But Sheila, just share some, what are two or three ways to just tangibly support refugees? Well, I love what Jenny just said about looking in our own neighborhood. That's, we have conversations like this all the time in our community at We Welcome of, um, of starting local. You know, we have these wonderful organizations like World Relief who are worldwide that we can support financially. But a lot of times people don't even realize we have resettlement organizations in our own town. You have refugees who might be living a few blocks away. Um, so we always recommend people start by looking into these organizations, you know, look, look to see which resettlement agencies and other nonprofits that support refugees are in your town or in your county um, and give them a call because I guarantee there's something that they, that they have that you can do. Um, and what we've seen is so many, there are opportunities for people regardless of, of what your gifts are, um, whether it's helping to prepare a meal for a family as they're arriving, picking up people at the airport. You know, if you have a minivan, you can be the person who's taking people to their doctor's appointments, helping take the kids to get registered for school. Um, there's so many needs. And one of the most important things that we've we found as well is that um, as we're meeting these needs, so many people are looking for a friend above anything else. They want someone who, who can be that support system, who they can call. Many people don't have, who are coming as refugees, they don't have any, any roots here in the, in the United States. They don't know any people in their town and so when they have something, they receive a bill that maybe there's a language barrier, maybe there's a cultural barrier, they have questions, who can they call? And being that person that they can trust and that, um, that truly cares about them is so important. Um, and secondly, something that we think about a lot is advocacy. And I know that word intimidates a lot of people and they feel like, oh, I don't know enough, I don't understand yeah. the policies. But advocacy is basically just speaking up, using your voice and your resources to speak up and to support the people in your neighborhood, the people that you care about, um, whether that's having conversations with your, your relatives and friends who may not be aware of the reality around refugees, sharing what you've learned, um, whether that's calling your senator and, and saying, you know what, we, we see that we're not resettling even near the cap for refugee resettlement. I think maybe we need more funding. We need more support for this program. So there's so many ways to get involved. And I think um, I'm excited to hear all the resources that you have, because I know there are so many good resources for people to get started. You know, and I was shocked. I mean, when I reached out um, to my local resettlement agency, it was a Lutheran Family Services, and you're not always going to have a world relief 
in your area, real, really local office, but we would suggest we love World Relief, obviously, and there are other resettlement agencies. They're not the only resettlement agency, but they're our, you know, preferred partner, <laughs> obviously, but there's a lot of good resettlement agencies in your local community, or at least nearby, and I was surprised when I reached out to mine, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds of people that were reaching out, and it just felt like, it was like, wow, my my community, I didn't know that my community cared so much. And to meet other people who are also interested, but that had different um, capabilities and capacity to do certain things. You know, someone can do ESL and someone can um, organize collecting furniture and to set up a home. Some of those can help just transport kids to and from activities or classes or getting like, you know, things that they need, very tangible things, grocery store, things like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't have to be this, I have to be knowledgeable about everything in order to engage. It really just is showing up with the love of Christ and just showing up and saying, what can I do? Open-handed, what can I do? And so I think what everything we mentioned, I think is really, really great because the resources just really lend into this. There's four resources that I'm going to give you. One of them is going to be to help build confidence in you, to help with learning, help you to get connected, and then one help with where to give. And so the first one that I would say is about when Sheila was like talking about advocacy, I think, again, it feels very paralyzing. Not sure what to say, not sure who to call, where to connect. And Women of Welcome has a really great guide called Using Your Voice Well. And that's going to be in the link in our bio, and it's going to be in our files if you're watching on Facebook. And it's a really great, very easy read that will help you connect and also know what to say and and feel confident about that. So that's the first one I would say is using your voice. Well, the second one I would say is if you're really like, I'm a book person, give me something to read. This is a really great book, Seeking Refuge by Matthew Sorens. Respond to something so complex and so massive when you're thinking about that. And it's a very easy read. It's a good read. So this is a good one to throw in your Amazon cart and get. And then um, as far as getting engaged and connected, what Sheila was just talking about, about getting close in your own community, at wechoosewelcome.com, they have a wonderful ways to engage page. And it's going to help you connect to local organizations to volunteer with and to engage in supporting refugees here and abroad. And the last thing that I would say is a lot of people are like, where do I give when I think about these things? And there's lots of agencies and lots of kind of organizations that um, say this is the place to give. But I really want Jenny to talk to us about the PATH because the PATH is an amazing avenue for long-term investment and engagement. So Jenny, can you share just a little bit about why we would recommend that people on this day would think about giving to the PATH? Yes, I think um, when we, whenever we look at a displacement crisis, we have to remember that it's not just one month or a few that really oftentimes turns into a protracted refugee crisis, which can sometimes be up to 10 years. And so the consistency of support, the consistency of presence um, to be able to provide and meet the needs of those who are displaced is, is essentially, uh, is, is essential. So the path is just an opportunity to join a community of givers at World Relief who give monthly to um, our work. And so uh, right now we are responding directly within Ukraine and Western Ukraine as well as meeting the needs of displaced Ukrainians in Romania and Poland and other surrounding countries and Moldova. Um, but also in the U.S., we are resettling refugees um, as well. And so the support that you give as um, a PATH maker, if you join the PATH, um, really helps us to support um, the work that we do on a consistent basis to help displaced peoples around the world. Um, and so um, having that regularity of support of, of financial support is, is just crucial to organizations because it helps us continue our work um, with um, knowing that we can, you know, plan around that, that giving and making sure that we can meet the needs of those who, who need it the most. And so, um, I mean, one of the things that makes World Relief unique is that we do try to work through the local church in every situation. So, and a lot of the work we're doing to help displace Ukrainians, we're working through local organizations, missions, agencies, and others that actually, um, this is kind of their first, uh, one of the first forays into just immediate humanitarian assistance, but we're partnering with them so that we can help them in that effort. Um, and so that's one of the key, the key things we're doing as well. So 
again, lots of opportunities to engage, but joining the path for World Relief. It's just worldrelief.org slash the path um, is just an incredible way to continue to partner with us at World Relief. And like Jenny said, you know, I think the beautiful thing about World Relief and giving to the path is like, is what she just said, and that is empowering the local church to be connected into the serving space. And World Relief does everything from legal help to tangible support on the ground, to supporting churches internationally that are doing this so that this is like long-term, it's not a flash in the pan. It's a long-term investment into the long-term journey that these vulnerable folks are having to walk through and go through and pairing them with a local church and a world relief um, ministry organization really allows them to stay connected in a way to uh, long-term resources and also to uh, be introduced um, to the gospel and to the love of Christ through the hands and feet of the international church. So um, that's what we recommend. Again, that is worldrelief.org slash the path. And we hope that you will join and be a path maker with us at World Relief. So we're going to put all of the resource links in the comments below so that each and every one of us here can have that for you all to reference. So thank you so much. We would obviously um, recommend that on this day and that every day that you would be thinking of that number of people. And like Jenny mentioned, that there's always a story behind that. And prayer is a powerful thing. And we would ask for the Lord's covering over these folks. We would ask for the Lord to give wisdom to our leaders that would appropriate the funding, that set the ceilings, that build the systems. And so prayer is such a, a huge thing in the midst of all of this. And we don't want to underestimate that that is a powerful tool that we all have as believers as well. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Sheila. We hope you have a lovely day. Thank you, Bree. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Bree. Bye. Bye.